Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Dominikanska 8. It is our privilege to welcome here Professor John Lennox. And I will now be handing over to Robert Rehag, who will be hosting this evening's discussion. Then there will be also a room for your questions. I will start by introducing Professor Lennox in English. For those who need simultaneous interpreting, please fetch your headphones. Let me uh, welcome you to our lecture here in Dominikanska 8. Uh, we did this lecture in cooperation with CTS and Czech Christian Academy. And the topic of the lecture is artificial intelligence, atheism, and the future of religion. Artificial intelligence uh, can increasingly imitate human abilities such as thinking, learning, or can create its own content that can't be distinguished from human work. It already plays and will play more and more uh, important role in our lives. And we will ask what's its potential, where are its limits, uh, what's the connection to religion, and what's the future of religion and atheism? Uh, for at least some of those questions, we will, we will have here excellent lecture, Professor John uh, Lennox, and please let welcome Professor John Lennox. I don't need to introduce Professor John Lennox, uh, uh, but I will do at least shortly. Professor John Lennox is well-known uh, mathematician, bioethics, and philosopher of science. He is emeritus professor of University of Oxford, and there he still lectures on uh, mathematics, philosophy, and philosophy of science, and is a fellow of Green Templeton College. He is author of several books like Has Science Buried God or uh, Can Science Explain Everything or 2084 Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. I prepared a joke for Professor Lennox because the Czechs are known for their sense of humor. So Professor Lennox, uh, if we speak about the artificial intelligence, I asked artificial intelligence a simple question. What would say Professor Lennox on the topic artificial intelligence, atheism, and the future of religion? And if you uh, want to laugh, I can read you the answer. So uh, given his background, it's possible that Professor Lennox might approach the topic by emphasizing the ethical implications. And I can't provide his specific views on the topic, but maybe there will be five points. And the AI named five points that you are going to say tonight. First, compatibility of faith and science. Professor John Lennox is known for his belief in the compatibility of faith and science. He argues that science and faith do not necessarily conflict with each other and can coexist in harmony. When it comes to AI, he may argue that advancements in artificial intelligence are a testament to the creative abilities of humans and do not necessarily challenge the existence of, existence of God or the validity of religious beliefs. This was the number one. Number two, ethical considerations. Lennox may emphasize the importance of ethical considerations in development and application of artificial intelligence. Third, challenges to atheism. Lennox is a critic of atheism, particularly so-called new atheism, championed by figures like Richard Dave, uh, Davekins, Christopher Hitchens, or Sam Harris. In the context of AI, he might contend that AI and the mystery of consciousness and intelligence pose significant challenges to atheistic worldviews and do not account for the existence 
of a transcendent reality. Four, human identity and AI. Lennox may discuss the implications of AI on the concept of human identity and what it means to be human. He may argue that while AI can replicate uh, certain aspects of human intelligence, in, it cannot replace the unique aspects of human consciousness, moral and spirituality, which he believes are grounded in a divine source. The fifth last point, engagement with science and technology. Lennox is likely to encourage religious believers to engage with science and technology, including AI, says AI. So let's, uh, let's think, uh, let's, let's, uh, let me thank you that you accepted our invitation and I pass uh, the floor to you. Thank you. Well. Dobry vecher. I'm afraid my check is not very good on Wednesdays. <laughs> so I shall speak English. And I hope you enjoyed my lecture. <laughs> because we can now go home. It's interesting because there were some lies in that description. Chat GPT is well known to make things up. And it told you a lie because I know that part of the literature on which ChatGPT has trained itself consists of at least two of my books. And it stole them without my permission. And you will know that in the United States, many authors whose works have been used have started a major litigation class action against OpenAI for that reason. Now, it's a huge pleasure for me to be in this city, more than I can really tell you, because it's here that one of my all-time intellectual heroes worked, Johannes Kepler. And he is an intellectual hero to me for many reasons, but the main one is that he took a step to revolutionize science and set it free from the worldview constraints that had been imposed on it from the time of Aristotle. Aristotle believed that perfect motion was circular. And so people had attempted for centuries to fit their observations of the stars and planets into circular orbits. And Johannes Kepler was invited by the then imperial Prague mathematician Tycho Brahe to come to Prague and to try to fit his very detailed observations into circular orbits or circles upon circles upon circles. He could not do it. The discrepancy was very small. And then he took a revolutionary step. And he thought, forget Aristotle. Let's go and look at what it's like. And so he stepped out of a philosophical worldview paradigm to simply look at nature. Now, that was hugely significant. Because, of course, it's something we meet today. There's a major issue with, within science still of a dominant atheistic worldview that actually is still constraining what is taken as science and what is not. We need a few Keplers today. And Kepler, of course, was a believer in God. Now, most of you don't know me, so may I say just a little bit about my background? I come from a very small country perched on the edge of Europe. It's called Ireland. And I come from the north of that country, which sadly has not got the best of reputations in terms of religious belief. 
And that's probably the first objection I met when I arrived in Cambridge a long time ago in the last century. I sat at dinner one night and a student said to me, do you believe in God, John? Oh, he said, sorry, sorry, you're Irish. I shouldn't have said that, I apologize. All you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. Well, of course, I'd heard that before. But what that did, I thought, I'm at Cambridge now, one of the best universities in the world. And I knew this Freudian objection would come again and again in my life. So what I decided to do that day was to befriend someone who did not share my Christian worldview. And there was a mathematician, he was the best mathematician of the year, a famous professor of logic now. He was an agnostic, and we started to discuss. And I have been befriending people all my life who don't share my worldview. And that is what has led to the convictions I hold at the moment. My parents were important because our country was divided by sectarian violence, as you know. My father ran a store, an old family type store that sold many different things and employed probably 30 or 40 people. But what he did was very unusual. In a country where there's huge sectarian tension, he tried to employ equally Protestants and Catholics. He was bombed for it. My brother got the full force of a bomb on his face, and he lost the sight of an eye and was damaged psychologically by it. And I said to my father one day, why do you do this? Why risk this? And he said, son, the very first page of the Bible teaches us that all men and women, no matter what they believe, are made in the image of God. And I intend to treat them like that. That was a hugely important thing to me because my parents' Christianity was real. I could see it translated into the way they lived. The second gift my parents gave me, which was equally unusual, they allowed me to think. Although they were convinced Christians, they didn't force it down my throat. Let me give you an example of that. When I was 14, my father gave me a book. He said, you should read this. I said, have you read it, Dad? No. Well, why should I read it? You, son, need to know what people think. It was the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> now, that was hugely unusual. But my parents encouraged me to read widely, and I've done it ever since. And at Cambridge, I entered into dialogue while doing mathematics. I was always interested in big questions. Where does mathematics fit in science? Where does science fit into our understanding of nature? Can science explain everything, the title of my book that you mentioned? Or is it limited? One of the people that realized that it was limited was another hero of mine for this country, Václav Havel. And he saw that very clearly. And when I came across his kind of books, because he was not a scientist, he was a literary figure, but he understood, like many literary giants do understand, C.S. Lewis was another, how science works and where its limitations were. And just a little bit more, I graduated from Cambridge and then I spent three separate years in the German-speaking world at various universities and learned to speak fluent German. And that led me into, during the Cold War, into this part of the world. 
mainly the German Democratic Republic, because I could speak their language fluently, but also to Hungary and Poland and once to this country. But I had to leave because of certain problems that you probably have heard of in uh, your history's past. I will translate and, spies. And that gave me a passion because many people, particularly in the German Democratic Republic, were not allowed a secondary education after the age of 13 because they refused to stand before the big statue of Marx in Karl Marxstadt and swear allegiance to the atheistic state. And I had direct experience of seeing how that kind of intellectual murder affected people. It moved me deeply. So I spent a lot of time encouraging people in Eastern Europe during the Cold War, mainly in churches and sometimes in the Academy of Sciences. But then the wall fell and I helped to knock it down. I was there and I have a bit of it at home. But then immediately I realized that I had to go to Russia. I have been a translator of mathematical Russian for many years, so I ended up in Siberia with a two-way ticket, I'm glad to say. And it was fascinating for me to interact with leading scientific figures who, of course, had been exposed to atheism for 75 years, longer than it had been in the German Democratic Republic. And in the subsequent years, up to about 2010, I visited Russia many times and Ukraine very many times. And that's my background to the fact that in life increasingly, I have got involved in the public debate, the intellectual defense of Christianity, taking on some of the so-called new atheists, but they're very old now, like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, because I really believe that the public ought to hear both sides of the story. I want them to hear both sides so that they can make up their own minds for themselves. So that's why I've been in the business of writing books, broadcasting, all this kind of thing. And it brings me to our topic tonight. Because a few years ago, I was asked to give a lecture on the topic of artificial intelligence and human identity. That led me to a great deal of research, which has resulted in a book called 2084. And those of you who know George Orwell will remember 1984. It might interest you to know that the title of my book was suggested to me by a very famous atheist, one of the most famous in Oxford at the moment, Professor Peter Atkins, whose books are in every university in the world, Professor of Physical Chemistry. Uh, we were going to a debate in a car, and uh, he said, what are you writing about? John. So I said, well, I'm writing about AI. Oh, he said, I've got a title for you. I said, have you, Peter? Yes, he said, 2084. And I immediately saw this was brilliant. So I said, Peter, if I use it, I will acknowledge you. I don't think the book's in Czech yet, but many of you will have read it in English or German. And uh, I do acknowledge him. So here's the topic, artificial intelligence, atheism, and the future of religion. And what I suggest we do, because this is a huge topic, is while I'm speaking, write down anything you'd like to ask as a question. I've had a very long day, and as long as my energy lasts, I will try and answer questions at the end. But write down things you'd like to raise, and please remember that I can only touch a very small part of this. When we come to artificial intelligence, essentially, we're talking about what Alan Turing, the genius that solved the Enigma problem during the war, were playing the imitation game. The word intelligence is slightly, uh, is slightly uh, 
well, dangerous and misleading, but it's the only word we've got here. Because an AI system is not intelligent. It simulates intelligence. But it simulates it in a special way using machine algorithms. It is not coupled with consciousness. Now, the reason for that is because no one knows what consciousness actually is. And for that reason, many leading AI researchers are content to simulate intelligence without consciousness, since consciousness is what is called the hard problem. Let's listen to two of the leading AI writers, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig. We are interested in creating programs that behave intelligently. The additional project of making them conscious is not one that we are equipped to take on, nor one whose success we would be able to determine. And many years ago, a man, Joseph McCray Mellichamp, a professor in the University of Alabama, who I met by accident one time, wrote a very interesting paper. He was a pioneer in AI. And the title of his paper is the artificial in artificial intelligence is real. Let him explain what he meant by that. It seems to me that a lot of needless debate could be avoided if AI researchers would admit that there are fundamental differences between machine intelligence and human intelligence. Differences that cannot be overcome by any amount of research. In other words, the artificial that is the word artificial, in the phrase artificial intelligence is real. Now, before we go any deeper, it's very important to realize that there are essentially two very distinct branches in AI, narrow and general. A narrow AI system is the one that we're familiar with. And it does one thing that normally requires intelligent human input. And we can list a whole lot of these with which we're familiar. Digital assistance, online shopping, uh, medical research like the development of the coronavirus vaccine, crime prevention using facial recognition technologies, autonomous vehicles using the same kind of technology, very sophisticated with sensors and all kinds of things. Then AI is increasingly taking over job interviews, about which there's been a lot of complaint. And of course, there's chat GPT. And as well as that, we've got autonomous weapons, and we have social control, disinformation, and deep fakes. Let me just make one or two comments about these things. Artificial intelligence is like a knife. A good knife can be used for surgery and it can be used for murder. The more advanced the technology, the more good it can do and the more evil it can do. Now, one of the biggest problems facing our culture today is this that technological development proceeds at a much greater speed than the ethical underpinning that's necessary to control it. And that is why there are so many big questions being asked, not only at local level or national level, but at international level, because there is concern in some quarters that there has been a loss of control of the technology that has been developed. It's hard to find out exactly what is meant by that. But just think of digital assistants. Well, they can be very useful. Online shopping. I buy a book from Amazon and I voluntarily pass on information to them, but of course, there is a downside. 
That information that is supplied to companies when we do online shopping is sold without our permission to third party institutions and a great deal of money is made off it. It's called surveillance capitalism and it has become a major concern because it's a billion dollar industry and most of us are completely unaware of it. Then there's medicine. Medical research in my home uh, university in Oxford, some brilliant breakthroughs have resulted from AI. But we know that AI in the hands of evil scientists can be used to develop all kinds of poisons that could wipe out a generation. Crime uh, prevention, uh, surveillance, uh, closed circuit television is so advanced now that they can recognize you not just from your face but from your back from the way in which you walk. And, of course, it's very useful for the police to be able to pick a terrorist from a football crowd. But we know that there are parts of the world where that same technology is being deployed to suppress, for example, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang in China in a surveillance economy that is very scary if you do any research on it at all. So it's the knife again. It's being used on the one hand to prevent crime. On the other hand, it's been used to control a population. And an article some time ago said that we in the West ought to watch because the very same technologies are available in the West. The only difference is they are not yet under the control of a centralized government, but they easily could be. So this is something we have to watch out for. And uh, now, just thinking of the last uh, thing, disinformation and deep fakes, it only takes a short clip, audio clip of me speaking to you tonight and an equally short video clip for the AI system to make me appear to say anything that people want me to say. And that's going to create utter chaos, according to many governments, when elections now come up. The capacity to manipulate elections is increasing exponentially with the advent of chat GPT and deep fake technology. So where does that leave us? And these are all technologies that are already operating. I say that because there's a great deal of science fiction involved in AI, and we'll come to that in a moment. But the narrow AI that's up and working is creating huge problems at every level. Listen to a world-famous biologist, E.O. Wilson. The real problem of humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and God-like technology. And it's terrifically dangerous. Until we answer those huge questions of philosophy that the philosophers abandoned a couple of generations ago, where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Rationally, we're on very thin ground. Now, I think E.O. Wilson is being a little bit too hard on philosophers because they and writers like Václav Havel have raised these questions. They're often called the questions of Karl Popper. Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? And what I'd like to say as a scientist is this. Those questions show the limitations of science, because the natural sciences cannot answer them. Sir Peter Medawar was a Nobel Prize winner who worked at Oxford and wrote a brilliant book, Advice to a Young Scientist. And in it he says, it is easy to see that the natural sciences are limited. They cannot even answer the simple questions of a child where do I come from? Who am I? Where am I going? And he added, it's to literature 
and philosophy, and I would add to theology and quite a lot else, history and experience, to answer those questions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please notice history, psychology, literature, and philosophy and theology are rational disciplines, but they're not the natural sciences. I say that because there is an impression around, which is logical nonsense, but it still is widespread, that the natural sciences are coextensive with rationality. So if it's not science, it's not rational, which is absurd because that very statement is perfectly rational, but it's not science. I'll leave you to think about that. So what E.O. Wilson brings us to are the big questions that neither the natural sciences nor technology can answer for us, not even chat GPT, because it knows nothing. It hasn't any concept of the meaning of the word cat. It has trolled billions of pages and can spit out an answer like the one you heard, and sometimes it can sound pretty good and get it right. But it has no awareness. It doesn't understand qualia. So we need to bring a worldview perspective into this. Now, many years ago in Cambridge, I was taught quantum physics by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne. And he writes, if we are to understand the nature of reality, we have only two possible starting points, either the brute fact of the physical world, which is, of course, the atheist worldview, or the brute fact of a divine will and purpose behind that physical world. Those are really the two diametrically opposed starting points which have interested me all my life. So that brings us to AI and religion. Pamela McCordick, writing about AI, said, it began with an ancient wish to forge the gods. Now, what's she talking about? Not narrow AI, but general AI. And Mo Gaudat, one of the famous AI researchers, said to someone, at a conference, we're creating God, you know. And the biologist replied, I know. And that brings us to what fascinates everybody, and that's the quest for artificial general intelligence, or AGI. Now, what's the idea here? Well, it's building a super intelligent AI system that equals or exceeds all human capacities. Remember, narrow AI does one thing, like recognizing faces. General AI does everything and more. And research proceeds in two directions. First of all, there's enhancing existing humans by bioengineering, cyber, cyborg technology, and so on, or by constructing a superintelligence on an organic, inorganic substrate like silicon. Because people get fed up with getting old. You can see I'm getting very old. In a few weeks' time, I shall be 80. Yes, 80. So I'm aware of this. Aging can be a very painful process. So people say, look, We've got clear minds, clear heads. Why can't we upload what's in our minds onto a silicon substrate so that we can do without the body and its aging and its decay and its death? It's a very attractive notion. And one person who's very interested in this is physicist Max Tegmark in his book, Life 3.0, where he writes, success in the quest for AI has the potential to bring unprecedented benefits to humanity, and it's therefore worthwhile to research how to maximize these benefits while avoiding potential pitfalls. 
Now, we've seen some of that with narrow AI, but now look at this next quotation in a TED talk. In creating AI, we're birthing a new form of life, really? With unlimited potential for good or for evil. Life, creating life, are we really? Uh, it's difficult. I'm very skeptical about that particular claim since we don't actually know what life is. And it's hard to build something when you don't know what it is. But someone who's pushing this very hard is Yuval Noah Harari, who's not a scientist. He's an Israeli historian, but has written two best-selling books, one called Sapiens and the other called Homo Deus, The Man Who Is God. And he feels that humankind is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design and extend life from the organic realm into the inorganic. That's the second kind of research to develop AGI. And he has an agenda for the current century, and it's this. We're going to make a serious bid for immortality in that we're going to solve the technical problem of physical death. Now, what he means by that is that there will be a medical solution found whereby human beings will not have to die, although they may die. That's the first agenda. The second agenda is the intensification of the pursuit of happiness. And in order to get there, says Harari, it will be necessary to change our biochemistry and re-engineer our bodies and minds so that we shall need to re-engineer Homo sapiens so that it can enjoy everlasting pleasure. Having raised humanity above the beastly level of survival struggles, we will now aim to upgrade humans into gods and turn Homo sapiens into Homo Deus. Now, this is a very ancient idea, you know. You'll recall that my father pointed to the first page of the Bible for the value of human beings as made in the image of God. Well, the second page tells us that the first attack on humanity was the temptation to disobey God and to eat the forbidden fruit and so become gods knowing good and evil. So the whole push started then and has gone up through history with all kinds of manifestations, with various usually emperors, Roman emperors, and before them the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians, telling their subjects that they were gods. And in modern times, we've had leaders who behave as if they ruled the universe. So the thrust in AGI of this kind is humanity reaching out to become God. Now, I say that because the Christian message is the exact opposite of that. It's God becoming human. Now, that has fascinated me. You see, if I might just add a word on that, it's diametrically opposite. And I ask myself, why and where does this drive to become gods come from? It mostly comes from atheism, actually. Many of the leading players, not all, of course, in artificial intelligence are atheists. I'm glad to say some of the most brilliant are actually Christians. And by the way, ChatGPT was right in what it told you in saying that I favor young, scientifically gifted people getting into this area, especially if they've got a religious dimension, if they've got ethical convictions, because we need people that understand the science to make sure that this kind of technology is policed properly. So it is a challenge to our generation. There's a clash of worldviews going on. Now, AI and religion is part of my title. 
And here is Neil MacArthur, director of the Centre for Professional and Applied Ethics at Montreal University in Canada. We are about to witness the birth of a new kind of religion. In the next few years, or perhaps even months, we will see the emergence of sects devoted to the worship of artificial intelligence. It's already happened, actually, and the reason is obvious. For certain AI systems are beginning to exhibit the kind of capacities usually ascribed to deity, such as immortality, omniscience, and omnipresence. These super AIs have prayer-like connectivity via the internet, the oracle-like capacity of ChatGPT to give a plausible answer to virtually any question about John Lennox or anybody else, to produce life advice and even scriptures almost instantaneously. Nor do they have needs or desires like humans, only electricity. And Harari says something quite scary. Simply by gaining mastery of the human language, AI has all it needs in order to cocoon us in a matrix-like world of illusions. Contrary to what some conspiracy theories assume, you don't really need to implant chips in people's brains in order to control them or manipulate them. For thousands of years, prophets and poets and politicians have used language and storytelling in order to manipulate and to control people and to reshape society. Now AI is likely to be able to do it. And once it can, it doesn't need killer robots to shoot us. It can get humans to pull the trigger. In the future, we might see the first cults and religions in history where revered texts were written by a non-human intelligence. So religion may well be generated, or some religions, by artificial intelligence. But then we come to the truth question. What about AI and truth? A former head of our cybersecurity center in the UK said, the fabric of society could be undermined by AIs impersonating real people so that it would no longer be possible to distinguish truth from falsehood. Deep fake technology will ensure that billions of people will be deceived. I asked GPT a question, sir. <laughs> Are you an atheist? Well, it went round and round in circles, and in the end, it was pushed to say, yes, it would be accurate to describe me as atheist. But then, of course, it's natural to ask chat GPT if it's a Christian. And... Uh, it went round the topic and then eventually said we can work towards harnessing AI in ways that align with our Christian values and promote justice. Religion. What about data religion? Harari again. The most interesting place in the world from a religious perspective is not the Middle East, but rather Silicon Valley. That's where the new religions of the 21st century are being created. Particularly important is data religion, which promises humans all the traditional religious prizes, happiness, peace, prosperity, and even eternal life. But here on Earth, with the help of data processing technology, rather than after death with the help of supernatural beings. And data religion has all kinds of beliefs. But let me come now to some futuristic scenarios. And there's quite a long history of them, and I'm starting with Vladimir Solovyov, his tale of the Antichrist, 1900. And he had this concept of a world empire. In 1921, Yevgeny Zamyatin wrote the book Mui, We, and he had a world government called One State. Then Aldous Huxley in 1932 wrote Brave New World, and his uh, universal state was called world state. And then, of course, 1949, there was George Orwell, who wrote 1984, and his world state was Oceania, and he made Big Brother famous. Big Brother is watching you, as in the eye in the title of the book. 
A very interesting comment was made on these two by Neil Postman in a famous cultural analysis book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. It's about North America mainly. He says, Orwell warns us that we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression, that is Big Brother. But in Huxley's vision, no Big Brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As Huxley saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. I think that's a very powerful statement in the light of what is happening through the kind of technology that we're familiar with, particularly to young people. Their capacity to think is being undone. Orwell said Postman feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. And as I look at culture today, I see both happening simultaneously. We've got a love-hate relationship with our tech technologies. So both things appear to be happening simultaneously. And one of the major issues, and I'm picking up now on Harari, is the notion of transhumanism. One of the world centers of this view is Oxford. Uh, the Oxford Institute for the Future, directed by Professor Nick Bostrom. And he defines transhumanism to be the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition through applied reason, especially by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. And some very eminent scientists have bought into this. Here's one of our most famous mathematicians and astronomers. Lord Rees says, we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligences a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us even though they may have an algorithmic understanding of the way we behaved. How he can be so confident that there is zero confidence, I'm not quite sure. So looking towards the future, it's not just historians and science fiction writers, but genuine high-powered scientists that think the world is moving into a general AI future, where in a sense, the cyborgs and robots may well take over. And some of them warn us, Yoshua Bengio is a very famous Canadian computer scientist. People need to understand, he writes, that current AI and the AI we can foresee in the reasonable future does not and will not have a moral sense or moral understanding of what is right and what is wrong. And Stephen Hawking of Cambridge, the late Stephen Hawking, wrote, the real risk with AI isn't malice, but competence. A super intelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing its goals. And if those goals aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. Now that brings me to something that's coming out of Oxford and other places. Effective altruism sounds very impressive. How can we best use our resources to help others? And said another way, it's about using evidence and careful reasoning to take actions that help others as much as possible. However, there has been a development here. Altruism is thinking about other people. But now, they're thinking about not other people, but what humans may become in the far distant future. And listen to this, because far more people will exist in years to come. Maximizing good means allocating a greater importance to the future. 
For instance, many long-termists identify studying AI as a priority since a hostile AI might end the species and wipe out generations yet unborn. And Bostrom himself says priority number one, two, three, and four should be to reduce existential risk. We mustn't, he says, fritter away, waste, our finite resources on feel-good projects of suboptimal eff efficacy, but listen to what they are, such as alleviating global poverty and reducing animal suffering, since neither of these threatens our long-term potential, and our long-term potential is what really matters. I find that very scary indeed. Because it's saying that we should now do nothing about poverty, famine, and disease in other parts of the world, but should pour our money into the super intelligent in the universities to develop long term entities. I won't call them human because they will be artifacts. Peter Singer, who's a famous ethicist, says, I don't think we know enough about the future. He's putting up a warning here. And what would be helpful to it? And we should not risk important present and near future goals for its sake. That being said, I do think we should try to reduce extinction risk. And we're not doing enough to prevent new and more serious pandemics emerging in various ways. So there's a divide in thinking the long-termists in Oxford and elsewhere. And may I tell you, there are billions of dollars being poured into this by some of the top billionaires in the world. The idea that we invest in the future, in super intelligences and creating them, and we forget about helping the poor. Whereas, Voices like Singer, and Singer is an atheist. I've debated him, and you can see it on the internet. He says, be careful. We should be doing something about the present. But in general, one of the most interesting commentators, a Jewish commentator, Leon Kass, well worth reading. We have paid, he writes, some high prices for the technological conquest of nature but none so high as the intellectual and spiritual costs of seeing nature as mere material for our manipulation, exploitation, and transformation. With the powers of biological engineering gathering, there will be splendid new opportunities for similar degradation of our view of man. If we come to see ourselves as meat then meat we shall become. Now, I'm old enough to have listened to the late Professor C.S. Lewis at Cambridge, who's quite well known in this country for his Narnia books, amongst other things. And in 1940, he wrote a book that I think every person interested in these cultural questions ought to read. It's called The Abolition of Man. What we call man's power over nature turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as his instrument. Man's conquest of nature means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. There neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. Man's final conquest has proved to be the abolition of man. And of course, this all raises the question, what is a human being? What is the value of a human being? And the divide between the worldviews is clear. Here's the atheist worldview, Sean Carroll's a physicist. We humans are blobs of organized mud. 
which through the impersonal workings of nature's patterns have developed the capacity to contemplate and cherish and engage with the intimidating complexity of the world around us. The meaning we find in life is not transcendent. Diametrically opposite to that is the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God made humans in his own image. Now, the first quotation there is an example of extreme reductionism. And one of the characteristics of the atheistic or naturalistic or materialistic worldview is to reduce everything to physics and chemistry. And I've been interested in it for a very long time. Why does it happen? And recently, there's been a magisterial work written by a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, Ian McGilchrist, called The Matter with Things. Now, this is a fascinating book, and it's led to much discussion. It's about the left and right brain hemispheres. Although the left and right brain hemispheres are both involved in virtually all brain activity, he writes, there are nevertheless important differences that have radical implications for the history of our understanding of reality. Each of the brain hemispheres pays attention to the world in a different way and therefore gives rise to a different kind of knowledge. Now, here's the interesting thing. The left hemisphere takes a part to understand the whatness of things, and the right integrates to understand the whyness. Now, he comes to the prevailing dominant account of a meaningless, purely material cosmos supplied by the reductionist strategy of the left hemisphere fails to make sense of value, whether that be truth, goodness, or beauty, just as it fails to make sense of consciousness. Beauty, morality, and truth have been devalued. If you want to see the consequences, you need do no more than look around you. And when Lord Jonathan Sachs, our former chief rabbi, the late Lord Sachs, read McGilchrist's first book, he put it together in a very interesting way. Science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts them together to see what they mean. And in a lecture that McGilchrist was giving, I asked him the question at the end. I said, are you telling me that new atheists like Dawkins are only using half their brain? And he said, that's exactly right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we appreciate this uh, great lecture. I would like to open discussion, but uh, I'm used to that the first question is always problem, so I will ask the first question and try to wake up the crowd. So, uh, Professor Lennox, you spoke here about uh, surveillance, surveillance industry, digital surveillance of people, increasing of disinformation. Even you, you spoke about chaos uh, that could start you the deep fake. I have a very simple question. What can we do against it? I think there are some practical steps. Let me give you an example of this that has happened to some of my friends. The telephone rings. They pick it up and they hear their daughter saying, I'm stuck in South Africa and I need to get home, mummy. Can you send me a thousand pounds for the plane fare? And the mother sends the money. But it's not her daughter telephoning. It's a deep fake. This is happening regularly already. Many of my friends have adopted the following strategy. And they tell their families, they say, any conversation on the telephone or by Zoom 
or Skype or WhatsApp, any conversation about finance, you must say a code word. So every family, and I have many friends, I'm doing this myself, so that if my son or my daughter, or my other son, if they want to discuss that kind of thing, they have to slip this code word in, otherwise I won't respond. So there is a practical way of avoiding deception. And I think it begins with all of us. It's very difficult to know what to do. Because here we are, and I've got an iPhone down here. It knows exactly where I am. And it can trace my movements over the past weeks and months. It may, for all I know, be listening to everything I say. And I volunteer to give this information. I'm crazy. But here's the problem. And it's put to many people, of course, even by authoritarian governments. You have to give up your privacy in order to have security. And that's the debate. It goes on in the Czech Republic. It goes on in the UK. It goes on everywhere. How much privacy are you prepared to sacrifice in order to have promised security? That's a problem that all of us... Uh, and there are no simple answers to this. I only say that what I need to do is at least, first of all, to start with where it might affect me. How could I be deceived? How could I be misled? How do I deal with this information? And I'm sure you don't all believe what you hear on television, even if it's from the BBC in London. I'm sure you don't always believe it all, do you? We learn to discriminate. And the difficulty is a lot of the answers to this kind of thing, it's a generic question, so there's no one answer to it. And a lot of the way we respond to lack or disinformation and misinformation has to do with our maturity as human beings. And people do get caught out. I'm particularly concerned for old people. The deception of old people is increasing exponentially, this kind of thing. Unscrupulous people, forcing them to part with their life savings, maybe, and leading them into poverty. Have you got an answer to this, sir? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Please. Uh, I think we should, uh, first of all, to study it uh, much more in details. Of course. Understand. And then uh, I think there is a no way against the development, but we should to try to, uh, to overgap all the troubles like the lack of ethical rules. So we should to come together as a human nature, uh, like mankind, and put together rules like behind those uh, borders we should not to go, like uh, the artificial, that there is a, a strife for artificial life and so on, or genetic uh, changing of gen genes and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, like recognize the danger and try to set up the limits. <coughs> And uh, that's why we would need also like people like you who would say like uh, there are the dangers and there are the, the ways uh, that we can use. I agree with that wholeheartedly and attempts have been made and are being made at the moment. There are all kinds of initiatives, the famous Asilomar principles and, uh, that have been set up. The difficulty it seems to me lies at the level of philosophical ethics. Uh, prominent in world ethical thinking is utilitarianism. Uh, maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. And that works very well if you're dividing ice cream among children. Uh, the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people is to give them exactly the same amount of ice cream or you're in trouble. You understand me? Well. And people feel that you can set up
principles that will gain agreement. Now that is possible, but it's only possible, it seems to me, where the centers of power are equal. When Hitler was in his political infancy, he made treaties. When he got the power, he just tore them up. Because if you say to me, you must regulate AI in this way, if I feel that you've got power, I may say, yes, I'll do it if you do it. But if I've got so much power, I'll say, you'll do what? That's the problem. How do we transcend this useful utilitarian ethic into something deeper. And I want to be controversial here, if I may. May I be controversial? And suggest that the only way we're going to get there is to have a transcendent dimension. If we look back over the history of Europe, and this country in particular, for thousands of years, the biblical ethic has dominated and provided us with our value system. But we're in the second or third generation now that have rejected that. And we have walked straight into an ethical vacuum. And we don't know what to believe is right and what is wrong. And until we discover some element of transcendence, remember what Lord Sachs says. Science takes things apart to discover how they work. Religion puts them together to see what they mean. And we have rejected the source, the ultimate source that can give us meaning, which I believe is God. So my radical view would be, until you and I agree that there's something outside both of us that transcends, then we'll get on all right, provided you don't get all the power. Or I don't get all the power. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Now, please, uh, questions. Before you place the question, please just introduce yourself uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Pavel Bargar. I teach at the Protestant Theological I Faculty. I can't hear you at oh, all. Sorry about that. My name is Pavel Bargar. I teach at the Protestant Theological Faculty here in Prague. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Professor Lennox, it was very fascinating. My question is whether you think, whether you differentiate between various kinds of atheists. Do you think there are atheists who uh, can be allies for people of faith uh, in a quest for the common good? Oh, thank you. That's a, a very perceptive question. Did you all get the question? Yeah. They, they, yeah. They, Atheists do not all, they're not all the same by any means. The new atheists that were referred to are pretty extreme in terms of their aggression and aggressiveness. That doesn't happen so much. I have many, many atheist friends, and I can learn a lot from them. I think the most important thing to say is this. Uh, I remember once in Hungary, one of the leading intellectuals asked me, the very first question after my lecture was, Professor Lennox, do you believe an atheist can behave morally? And I smiled, and I said, of course. I'll go even further than that and say I could be put to shame by the way an atheist behaves. And the reason I believe that is possible is we are all, whether we're atheists, Christians, Hindus, or whatever, we are all moral beings. I believe that morality is hardwired. And I notice that people like Noam Chomsky have come to believe the same thing about truth. Morality appears to be hardwired. Otherwise, and I think this goes back to what you were saying, if there was not some sense in which we shared a common set of moral views, society would completely collapse very rapidly. It's very interesting, and I've done the research. C.S. Lewis did it long ago in the book I mentioned, 1940. If you take every world religion, pagan religion, 
every philosophy, atheist philosophies, religious philosophies, every single kind, all of them, they all have at least one thing in common. That is the so-called golden rule. Do unto others as they would do unto you. It's everywhere. And that, to my mind, is evidence that it's hardwired into human beings. So my answer to your question is yes, of course. And I find in some of my public debates, and you can see many of them on YouTube, I find myself agreeing with atheist critiques of what's, what is going on today. I don't share all of their views, of course not. But you see, the difference between us is, myself and say, uh, Richard Dawkins, he appears to believe, although his philosophy denies it, in more or less the same morality as I do. But when he's asked to justify it, his reasoning will be very different from mine. There are two different issues here. There's the existence of common morality, which gives us some hope of doing something, as Dr. Reha has said, but there's also the underpinning that gives you the rationality behind it. Why do you believe in this particular thing? And there, in fact, there are differences that everybody will readily admit. Thank you very much. There was a question in the mid middle, yeah. Good evening. Um, I'm Martin Krutsky. I'm a student of <coughs> artificial intelligence at uh, Czech Technical University. And um, my question was <coughs> towards the, uh, the idea of uh, learning, the idea of intelligence. <coughs> what is your reasoning behind um, your claim that, uh, <coughs> well, we are doing this imitation uh, by developing, the imitation of intelligence by developing AI? And you had the quote that artificial intelligence is always artificial. So what is your reasoning that <clears throat> we cannot imitate the intelligence kind of enough to, for it to become the real intelligence? I, I would understand this, this reasoning, for example, for conscious, uh, consciousness um, or <clears throat> well, some other qualities uh, that they are qualitatively different from, uh, from what we can simulate. But do you think that intelligence is similar, that it's something qualitatively different? Thank you. That's uh, another very interesting and important question, actually. The key issue for me is this. Machine intelligence is algorithmic. And it seems to be the case that there are certain capacities of the human mind that are non-algorithmic. There's a very famous mathematician who came from this part of the world. His name is Kurt Gödel. And he demonstrated some fascinating results that Roger Penrose, who's probably the cleverest mathematician alive today in my own university in Oxford. And Penrose argues that the human mind is capable of proving results like Gödel but they're non-algorithmic, and therefore no machine will be able to do them. Because within this whole, uh, the theory, uh, computer theory, there's a very famous thesis, the Church-Turing thesis, that says that any algorithmic, any computer, past, present, or future, can be simulated by what's called a Turing machine. But Turing machines cannot do things like this. So Penrose argues, and of course, people have vested interests in this. They don't have to believe Penrose if they don't want to. But I find him very sympathetic in his argument that there is a huge gap there. But what interests me, again, in answering your question is the leaders in these fields who understand a great deal more of them than me are not pretending that we're getting any, anywhere near that kind of thing. We're not even approaching it because it's of, I think you used the word, a different quality. These machines do not understand. They may manipulate the word cat, but they've no idea what a cat is. They have no idea. They have no ideas. 
So it seems to me that from a mathematical point of view and what is done in the philosophy, there is a huge difference. There's a wonderful, you may know the Chinese room experiment, do you, of John Searle? Because that is, I think, a very good example of the simulation of intelligence without any intelligence whatsoever. But that's a very interesting topic and people have looked at it. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's go one by one. So I think the gentleman in white was the first, yes, second, and third. Thank you. I actually have a related question, so I'm happy. My name is Andrzej Galushka. I'm affiliated with the Faculty of Arts here. Um, well, um, speaking of consciousness and artificial intelligence, of course, with uh, narrow AI, you speak about, of course, the lack of consciousness. But it seems to me that with artificial general intelligence, and especially with the alarmist uh, models, there is some kind of um, um, expectation that there will be consciousness. Uh, remember, there's the Stephen Hawking uh, quote where, we sa where he says, the problem is competence if the goals are not aligned with our goals. And that kind of presupposes that artificial intelligence has some goals of its own, right? So maybe some, some kind of consciousness. Also, uh, that quote stood out to me that uh, we are, cre the, the programmers are creating God. Well, it's hard to imagine God without consciousness, right? So uh, my question is, do you think that even general AI uh, will not be uh, conscious? And if that is so, is there really reason for such great alarm? Or is the, is the alarm or, or, or the danger of artificial general intelligence pretty much the same as artificial narrow intelligence? Thank you. Thank you. Let me see, there are about six questions there. <laughs> And at this time of night, it's difficult to separate them. Let, let me make one or two. It's a hugely interesting topic, this. The assumptions behind your question. You see, competence will increase, as Hawking says. You can put a whole lot of narrow AIs together, for example, is the argument. So you get something that's very competent now. It's competent, but it is no more intelligent than the individual AIs. And the control problem, that interests me, and it's related to what you have to say, because the, some of the leaders in these fields have called for a moratorium in the development of ChatGPT. Stop. Why? The answer is we don't understand how it works. Now, I wonder if they're not telling us everything. I just don't know. But I don't see any evidence whatsoever that we're making any progress whatsoever towards consciousness, but we are making lots of steps towards increased competence. And that's enough to worry. If, if the designers of GPT are worried about what they've already done, and that's narrow AI, there's no AGI there at all, then it is something that we need to be concerned about. Because whatever the status of the actual entity and machine in itself, its moral consequences and its devastating consequences for people, for example, deceived by deep fake and so on, are horrific enough. So, I don't think there's any easy answer to, to your question. But part of the assumption behind asking the question is, are we going to reach AGI? And then you come up against the fact that there's many different kinds of imagined AGIs, as there are people proposing it. Tegmark has a whole series of them. I didn't mention them tonight uh, because of time, but I mentioned them in my book. And uh, you can read about them in Tegmark's Life 3.0. He's very interested in imagining uh, AGI scenarios. But of course, imagining them and creating them 
is a very different thing. One uh, leading researcher says, you can forget all this stuff about consciousness. We haven't got as far as a worm yet. So that'll have to do on that one. But keep going. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Here first, maybe. OK, OK. If we'll make sure this man gets his question. So m maybe place quickly our question, and then we'll go. I was trying to get the word even before. Uh, OK. I decide. OK. okay. Le give it to your young gentleman, and then uh, we will go. I'm uh, Good evening. My name is David Plevka, and I'm a student of theology. And uh, my question is, what would the creation of true general AI mean about our own consciousness? <laughs> Someone once said, the very clever man, that the first invention of general AI would be the last invention humans ever make. And that's a possible answer to your question. Uh, I, I think hypothetical questions are wonderful because it's very difficult. You can speculate as much as you like. And since I am very skeptical about whether the first assumption behind your question will ever be realized, I would just make that point, which is slightly facetious. But the implications for humanity, they would depend, and you're a theology student, so we need to take a theological perspective of this. And it's very interesting that that idea of humans becoming gods, that's where I would start to pursue it, because I think that is one of the deep drivers of this. People trying to be gods in their own super intelligent status, but also in their own power. And that is to open a whole new field of questioning. But we must come to this man, and he's going to be the last. So, short, please. My name is Martin, Martin Janicek. I would like to ask you a very small question. I was just now reading something about Emanuel Swedenborg, the Swedish yeah, yeah. thinker. Swedenborg. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I have read that uh, when he was already older, uh, he started to say to the people that he spoke with some spirits and uh, even perhaps with Jesus. And uh, some people, of course, uh, thought he became mad. Mm -hmm. But all testimonies uh, said that uh, he was completely normal all the time. Just do, you think, do you think that it, uh, artificial intelligence could help us to distinguish between something which is a problem of psychology or psychiatry or what is something miracle? Well, uh, what you're touching on is actually extremely important. The philosophy of materialism, which dominates many universities in the world today, including my own, teaches that this world is all there is, and mass energy is the fundamental stuff of the universe. I do not believe that to be the case. I think God is the fundamental reality in the universe, and God is not mass energy. God is spirit. And I think we need to think in a completely different way, and this goes back to theology with the student back there. I was at a conference once, and there was a very famous professor talking about what's called dual aspect monism, saying that there's only matter, and there are emergent phenomena on top of matter, like mind and so on, but there's only one stuff. And I waited for a while, then I put up my hand, and I said, I've got a question. I said three words. I said, God is spirit. The reaction was incredible. She lost her temper and said this. She said, my philosophy cannot cope with that. And she left the platform and walked out of the conference. And that taught me a lesson. Spirits are real. There is a world, a realm beyond this one. Now, we need to be very careful. 
because historically people have imagined all kinds of things and ended up in psychiatric institutions. But the bad side of this doesn't mean there isn't a correct side. And so I believe that this is a word-based universe, not a matter-based universe. In the beginning was the word. And that is a statement about existence. In the beginning, the word already was. That is, the word never came to be. Because the next statement that John makes there, and this fascinated the ancient Greeks, they were interested in the difference between things that exist eternally and things that came to be. Everything, says John in his gospel, came to be, which is what the Greek literally says, through the word. So the word is primary, and the things that came to be, including the stars, the universe, and you and me, are derivative. Whereas in the naturalistic worldview, it's the opposite. Mass energy is primary. Now, I know that you physicists out there will say, no, they're not. Nothing is primary. And we could get into a long discussion, but I've written a book about that, so I leave it. It seems to me that the Christian faith starts with word as the primary thing. And we need to listen to Václav Havel again when he wrote years ago a little essay called A Word About Words. But that's enough of me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for giving me such an interesting evening. No, let us thank you.